that. <laughs> Good morning again. I am by far not the infamous Anita Brown Graham, but I will fill in for her until she's able to join us. So welcome to the state of play for underestimated entrepreneurs. So what is this session? When we looked at this particular session and how we thought it would be applicable, what we've said is between work from home, PPP loans, soaring real estate and delivery for all, we're returning to a world that looks very different than the one from a year ago. Or are we not? It could be argued that the disparities we see are more of the same. This panel of national experts will discuss the current climate for black businesses as well as the opportunity and headwinds to come during the recovery. So with, real briefly, I'd like for our panelists, our distinguished panelists to begin by providing some introductory remarks. And as I see our famous Anita Brown Graham coming into the screen, Mr. Jim Castleberry, will you go ahead and just start and introduce yourself to our audience? Well, good morning, Tammy. Sure. Um, my name is Jim Castleberry. I am uh, the Chief Investment Officer for 4S Bay Partners. Um, we have a partnership with um, Partners in Equity and uh, Resilient NC um, with uh, Napoleon and, and Taleb and Wilson um, to help uh, underserved entrepreneurs within uh, North Carolina. We're very happy to be here. And the predominance of the work that we do is in fact to narrow the gap between racial, social, and economic inequalities. I'd like to just go ahead real quickly if we could pause and I wanna switch over to Anita Brown Graham. And if you do not mind, I'd like to have you take over and drive us forward. Thank you, Tammy. I really do appreciate it. And hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you. As some of you know, certainly the conference moderators, 
I am on a seven hour time difference. So my apologies for having some glitches and getting in on time, but we're here and we're gonna have a great conversation and learn a lot from this fabulous um, panel. So yes, I'm Anita Brown Graham. I'm on the faculty at the UNC School of Government and the director of the NC Impact Initiative and a great fan of all the organizers of this conference, which is why I'm here some seven hours time difference away. Jim, thank you so much for your introduction. And I'd like to just ask if the other panelists would do the same thing. So I'll turn to Bill Bynum, CEO of Hope Credit Union. Bill, if you'll say a little bit about your, your, yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Good morning. It's great to be back in North Carolina virtually. I grew up in North Carolina, but I am now in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, I am the CEO of HOPE. HOPE is a multi-headed organization that works in the blackest and poorest part of the country, um, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee, the Alabama Black Belt, the Mississippi Delta. Um, we exist to reduce the extent to which race, gender, birthplace, uh, who your parents are, determine your ability to, uh, to climb the economic ladder, to support your family, your community, and to otherwise prosper. Uh, we do this by filling gaps. Um, our primary tool for doing this is financing. We started as a one and a half million dollar loan fund. We then started a credit union out of my church to um, uh, attack payday lending. Uh, and those eventually merged together. Uh, we are now about a $600 million uh, regional entity, uh, small relative to the need, but uh, we do a lot by um, connecting the dots, facilitating access to resources and relationships, things that non-Black entrepreneurs have more readily available than than, than, than we do um, through their family, friends, and social networks. And we also try to multiply impact through policy advocacy to close the gaps that limit opportunity. And so again, that's, um, I'm the CEO of HOPE and I'm look, looking forward to this conversation. And of course, Bill, you know that there are a number of us in North Carolina with our fingers continually crossed that you'll come home to us one day. Uh, Melissa Bradley, would you go next, please? Sure, it's my pleasure to be a part of this. I want to thank uh, Napoleon and Talib for uh, always making sure I know what's happening in the great North Carolina, where many of my relatives are from. I'm currently based in Washington, D.C. I have the privilege to be founder and managing partner of 1863 Ventures. We are an accelerator program for what we call New Majority Entrepreneurs, and our goal is to create $100 billion of new wealth by and for New Majority businesses within the next 10 years. I also have the privilege to be general partner of 1863 Venture Fund, where we invest in our entrepreneurs through revenue-based financing, as well as equity or equity-like investments. But to date, we have served over 3,000 entrepreneurs. We're happy to say that all of them uh, continue to grow. Uh, last year, even in COVID, we experienced significant growth of our companies and our greatest desire is job creation. Uh, we recognize that black businesses in particular are drivers of economic prosperity in their community. And I'm proud to say that over our five-year existence, we've helped create over 10,000 new jobs. Thank you, Melissa. So listening to Bill, Melissa, Jim, and the success that they are having, it feels at least to me in dissonance with some of the language that's being used around this conference, in particular, the two words underestimated entrepreneur, because you are demonstrating that with the right supports, um, entrepreneurs will succeed. And so I wanna start by just asking each of you to discuss what the term underestimated entrepreneur means to you. And Melissa, since we ended with you last time, let's start with you this time. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I think an underestimated uh, entrepreneur uh, looks like me, uh, looks like Jim, uh, looks like Bill. I, I think that in this world where investors tend to focus on pattern recognition, focus on pedigree, 
uh, and focused on a different type of social capital that we oftentimes are not there. And when you look at statistics, we are not only underestimated and underrepresented when it comes to where we sit in board seats, where we sit in venture capital firms, but we're certainly well underrepresented when it comes to how capital is being distributed. And even when we think about uh, the historical opportunity that's been provided Black businesses and supplier diversity, we're, we're no longer there where we used to be. So I think it's important that we're not only underrepresented and underestimated from uh, the supply side of who's looking to support us, it, it's a real challenge because we know that because of research that AEO did in their tapestry project, we're missing out on over a billion dollars of economic prosperity by this underrepresentation and underestimation of our power and potential to contribute profit to our own communities, but also to this country. So a term that is more than just its own definition, but it represents a real opportunity cost on behalf of America and supporting one of the fastest growing segments of entrepreneurship in this country. So Jim, let me go to you next. I love the way Melissa set up that dichotomy between underrepresentation and underestimation. Um, but if you were talking to the average investor, they would say, yeah, we understand underrepresentation, but underestimation doesn't matter because we will invest in anybody, anywhere who we think will give us the right returns. So from your perspective, when you hear the word, words, underestimated entrepreneur, what does that mean to you? Well, Anita, um, the thing we have to always remember is that we've been, we have been entrepreneurs. We, we have, um, black and brown people have been entrepreneurs literally since, um, the end of slavery and sometimes before slavery. And we've always been in, in the ebb and flow curtailed from the ability to have the same level of achievement and success that the, our majority counterparts have. And that's primarily because we have systematic issues and systems that are in place that impede what would be a natural progression or ability to be able to, to be able to succeed. And so that's one of the things that I believe fosters the continuation of us as a community being underrepresented, being underserved, and being underestimated. So how do, we, how do we go about curtailing that? And the way that we go about curtailing that is being able to create, being, being in positions like the three of us are, where we have decision rights, where we have control over the ability of where capital goes. But we have to also challenge all of the systematic processes that have been put into place because they're just accepted as being okay. They're accepted as being the standard. When, if we think about it, we have empirical evidence that it's not working, right? George Floyd, January 6th all in part and parcel of this dichotomy that's being created by the gap in wealth. And that the whole adage of greed is good or maximizing return, just pure financial return is good. It isn't when it doesn't look at the utility of the return that it has within the communities that we live in. And that's what we're seeing. That's why we're seeing all of the things that are an outgrowth and sy systematic of an economy and a structure that does not address a part of the community that helped build the country. <laughs> a lot to unpack there and, and we will get to how do we go from here to where we need to be 
even despite the disruptions of COVID. But let me ask you, Bill, whether you want to weigh in on this phrase, the underestimated entrepreneur. What does it mean to you? No, I, I agree with, uh, I finally agree with Melissa nine, nine out of 10 times. And, you know, any non-white entrepreneur is an underestimated entrepreneur. Any black person is an underestimated person. I, I think about a good friend and mentor from several years ago. I don't know what Gary Grant is, or if any of you all know Greg, Gary Grant. But Absolutely. He's a, Can't be yeah. in North Carolina and not know Gary Grant. Yeah, Gary, Gary is an entrepreneur. He's also a civic leader. And, and let's not forget that people take business Lead business um, leaders seriously. We, you know, I don't need to remind you who we paid rent for at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue over the past four years. Um, but, but I remember Gary once told me, "Be careful, or I'll include you in my plans." And you can either take that as an ominous warning or as a positive. It depends on whether we do what we need to do to balance the scales and equip people of color to succeed. You know, it, it's a positive if you really acknowledge the McKinsey data, the, the data that Melissa shared at AEO um, documented in his tapestry report. McKinsey said that closing the racial wealth gap will add one to one and a half trillion dollars to the gross domestic product over 10 years. Um, so, you know, I think the past year has shown us two sides of the coin of this un underestimated entrepreneur. It's shown how vulnerable they are as, as the rate of Black business closures is 15 to 20 percent higher than the rate of, 50, of white business closures. It's also shown how important black businesses are in terms of jobs for black people. We disproportionately employ um, low income, uh, lower mobility, lower skilled people. It's also shown how invaluable black businesses are to stability for black communities and equipping uh, families to support themselves and to support their communities in what is an increasingly uh, black and brown nation. And so I think we, as Gary said, we underestimate um, these black entrepreneurs and black people at, at our own peril. So let's stick with Melissa for a moment because Melissa, it's hard for me to imagine that Bill agrees with you nine out of 10 times, not 11 out of 10 times, but we won't talk about that right now. Let's, let's talk about numbers for a second. Um, the most recent numbers we have show that 41% of Black firms closed their doors during the pandemic. And then the census recently reported that of those firms that remain, 58% say their business's financial health is at risk or distressed. So, Given that reality, it almost boggles the mind that somehow you've been able to help 92.5% of your companies survive and that almost 60% of them either increased their staff or had no change to staffing at all. Talk to us a little bit about what is the magic sauce and how do more of us get some of it? Because with those kind of numbers, I don't know why we would have underestimated entrepreneurs. Well, um, first of all, I, I want to just acknowledge, I'm just happy Bill and, and Jim agree with me at any point in time. Uh, they, they are two gentlemen that I look up to and, and have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, and continue to learn from every single day. Um, I think that our, our secret sauce is, is first and foremost listening to the entrepreneurs. Uh, when, when I started 1863 Ventures, it was literally started as just a project in D.C. to counteract the policies that were being enacted with a focus on micro businesses, which are great, but a complete uh, disavowalment of larger black businesses in DC, which in a place like Chocolate City, there was just a clearly lack of data that showed the number of multi-million dollar businesses that existed here and why a thousand dollar grant was not going to help them. When we reached out to those folks, which already, I would say, exceeded expectations of already hitting over a million dollars, and we heard from them the things we hear now, we're overcoached, we're over mentored. But the reality was is that they were not getting the right type of assistance. And so with the team of six that I have, all of us are entrepreneurs. 
All of us have been investors. That's a big deal because most entrepreneurial programs right now are taught to, I would say, want to be entrepreneurs and not people who have been entrepreneurs. And there's a big difference. Entrepreneurial education is not something that you should teach from a textbook, but it's something that you know. The second thing is, is of the seven of us, three of us have had prior exits. And so we truly understand the blood, sweat, and tears required to scale. And then the final thing is we are clear that we are sector agnostic. We're not trying to be experts in tech. We have certainly gained a tremendous amount of expertise in CPG, retail, and food and beverage because that's where 70% of the Black businesses are. So really understanding our audience, we then focused on what does it take to run a business? Not how to pitch, not how to raise money, but what does it take to actually acquire customers? Because we believe cash is the best investment that you can ever get. And so we focus on things like customer acquisition, retention, ongoing customer discovery, channel partners, and expanding distribution. We talk about people. We talk about culture. How do you retain staff? We talk about finances and financing and how your first investor should be yourself and your business. And we spend an inordinate amount of time uh, talking about operations and systems so that we know that when the money does come, they actually know how to run a business. I, I am tired of anybody running after all these television shows and getting a bunch of money and not knowing what to do with it. There's a woman who actually came from North Carolina who won a pitch competition and she won $25,000. And I checked in with her two months later, so how's it going? She goes, oh, we're barely making it. And I was like, well, you had all these plans. She's like, girl, I put that $25,000 check on the wall because I've never gotten that much money before. And honestly, I don't know where to spend it. And so we realize this concept of contextual technical assistance is critical. And then we match it with ongoing coaching for as long as they want. And then we match it with capital. Just getting money and not knowing how to spend it. And let me speak for myself as somebody who grew up with no money. When money comes, I'm the first person to be paralyzed because I'm like, wait a minute, am I going to keep it? Is it going to work for me? When, what if an emergency comes? And I think we have to recognize that working with Black entrepreneurs is not just around how they grow their business. It's undoing the historical oppression and misunderstandings we have about managing capital and reminding them that imposter syndrome is BS and that it is built into our DNA and a core part of our culture to become entrepreneurs. And so the final step is just demystifying the crap that they have heard and making sure that they understand they stand on the legacy of queens and kings who have actually been amazing entrepreneurs. And it is their right to be able to assume this and to not let anybody from Silicon Valley to Silicon Alley tell them otherwise. So I don't know whether you're watching the chat box, but it is um, going crazy with all that you've said. And I want all the people who are participating, many of whom I recognize the names to know that they'll have a chance to ask some questions at the end of this, but I encourage them to lean in, clap hands, indicate their own responses in the chat box until we get to that. And Melissa, I just wanna ask you so that there's absolute clarity. When you talk about contextual coaching, do you mean coaching that is culturally competent or do you mean individualized coaching? Those both. being two things, different things. Yeah, okay. yeah so we do both. Um, the majority of our entrepreneurs are African-American, about 94%. Uh, about 3% are Latinx entrepreneurs and just under 1% are Asian American entrepreneurs. So we try to support entrepreneurs of color, but our primary focus is on black and brown. When we talk about contextual technical assistance, we're one talking about cultural competency. So everyone on the team is trained in cultural competency and anyone that we work with, any coach or mentor has to go through our training. The second piece is that we talk about contextual, we do not say, hey, every business is the same. And so we really, in the final weeks of our program, we parse out CPG companies. We parse out food and beverage companies. This time we even parsed out cannabis companies. And we make sure that once they've got all the information on how to grow their business, they now understand what does it take to be successful in their respective sectors. This is not a one size fits all. You have to appreciate that someone still has a full-time job. You have to appreciate somebody's in Jackson, Mississippi, and that's very different than having resources if you're sitting in Palo Alto. So we really try to get to understand the entrepreneurs. And when we get together, we call it a family reunion because these are folks that from day one, 2014, we still keep in touch with, we still track, and they still call us for help. Man, you know, every now and then we hope that the magic sauce is easy, but it is clear in this circumstance, we get why it's a winning sauce, but it isn't easy to put together. Jim, Bill, any reactions to what you've just heard Melissa say? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the sauce is messy. Um, <laughs> it, it is not a straight line. Entrepreneurship is not for the faint of heart. Um, if you're not willing to put in the time and take a few bruises, then get a job. Don't, don't be an entrepreneur. But if you do go for it, I think it's important not to get out over your skis. You know, know what you do well and build on it and be honest about what you don't know and find a way to fill in the gaps. You know, nobody's great at everything. Uh, even the most successful entrepreneur gets help from somewhere, you know, whether they admit it or not. Um, you know, and since, you know, but it is different for Black entrepreneurs since so much opportunity has been withheld or extracted from Black people and communities that helps harder to come by. Again, you don't, you don't have the same, you know, I don't have a, 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 a brother that's an accountant, a church member who's going to give me that contract. Um, and, and so help is harder to come by. And so we have to work harder. And the solutions may not be traditional and may not be textbook. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, any other best practices you want to put on the table for supporting Black businesses? You know, it is, it is, um, you know, we need the same things that everyone else needs. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge the, the, the reality differences as, you know, not just geographic, but um, just the resources that are available or not available to entrepreneurs of color. And so banks who just want to um, give a big pronouncement that they're going to put $30 billion into Black and then just relabel what they've done are not going to make a difference. It, it, um, so you've got to listen to the entrepreneurs. You've got to, you know, they, they, these big businesses did not get big without uh, having great data analytics. You know, they, 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 they have number crunches. They have um, people who can drill deep and understand the market dynamics. But you, you've got to take the time to do that on what is quickly becoming the majority of the country. If you don't do it, as Gary Grant said, um, you know, it, it, it's, at your own, it's at your own demise. Well, let me stay with you for a minute, Bill. Um, I've been a follower and know that you've spent your entire career in service of advancing economic opportunity for all people in communities. And as a result, you've seen, you've managed, you've survived, you've helped others survive many crises. Talk to us a little bit about what was different about COVID-19 and what are some particularly best, particular strategies that you would like to share with fellow funders and bankers to strengthen communities and build their assets in light of what we learned over the past 14 months? Well, th thank, thank you, Anita. I, you know, we have chosen to, to work in some of the hardest places. I said that the Deep South is the blackest and poorest part of the country, um, it, it, but it's very similar to Northeast North Carolina. You know, we've got inner cities and communities, you know, I work with in North Carolina that have similar challenges. It's just more concentrated, but it's deep rooted. And, but the fact is that we have done some of our most impactful work in the aftermath of disasters. And um, we've come out on the other side stronger. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, we, we did some of the early work. We built some of the first houses on the, on the on Mississippi coast, you know, when the governor, um, who's not as, um, wasn't as, 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 as insightful as, as, as Roy Cooper. Um, you know, I've known Roy since he was student attorney general when I ran the Black Student Movement at Carolina. Uh, I, I wish that our governor had had some of his insight um, after Hurricane Katrina because there was not a low-income housing uh, plan. Um, and, and, and most of the resources went toward, as they do after crisis, these programs are not designed to help those who need it most. It, it, if you look at what happened after Katrina, there were billions of dollars that went into the pockets of those who already had resources, who had insurance, and the rest of the folks who are disproportionately black and brown were not a factor. So we did pilot work. We, and at the end of the day, we were able to provide um, support to 10,000 families and, and got $600 million 
in support, but that wasn't until we did the R&D work and then we do the policy advocacy to jump on the table and bring their voices to the folks who control the resources. Uh, same thing after the housing and financial crisis, um, banks were closing in record numbers. Not, I think Bloomberg said 93% of the bank branches that closed uh, were in low income communities. And I, those were disproportionately communities of color. You know, we went from eight branches to 30 branches. We ran to the fire and tried to put it out. And as a result, we were able to keep those vital financial services in these communities. It's not like those communities where those 2000 plus bank branches closed, all of a sudden stopped needing support for their families uh, to buy a home, to, you know, to, to buy a car, to get to work. Um, uh, instead, they were subjected to, to predatory. Uh, high cost financial services. And so, you know, we, 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 we quadrupled our footprint. And, you know, fast forward to this past year. In a normal year, Hope does 50 small business loans. Uh, over the past, you know, 15 months, we did 5,000 paycheck protection loans. You know, 90% of those were to Black people, 18,000 jobs. You know, over the course of our 27 years here in the Deep South, we channeled $3 billion into some of the most underserved communities, helped 2 million people. Um, and if this is all focused on under, un, underbanked people in places. So, you know, one man's trash, it's another man's treasure. We've consistently gone into these communities and, and have done good and have done well. Our financial performance in 2020 was our best ever. We're expected to, we expect to double our balance sheet in the next few years because of the, the, what we are seeing in terms of people's acknowledgement that, you know, this is a more diverse country and we, we need to pay a little bit of attention to it. You know, for years, Jim Johnson at, at UNC has been preaching about the browning and graying of America. Black and brown America is a growing market. Half of the youth below age 18 in Mississippi are non-white. So, so who is a minority? You know, who's going to be a minority? Um, these folks need everything that everyone else needs. They need everything that corporations sell. Uh, they need all your bank products and service. And again, you, we ignore these markets at our own peril. And, and by the way, in addition to markets, they're also your future workforce, your innovators and your CEOs. So I just say betting on black is a good investment. Melissa, Jim, so if you had to pick one thing that you just heard Bill say, either the thing that caused your heart to soar just a little bit, or the thing that if you had a highlighter in hand, you would get it out and just start marking over because you want people to remember that one thing, what would you emphasize to the folks listening to this panel this morning? And I'll start with you, Melissa. Well, I put it in the chat. Um, we do not use the word minority at 1863 Ventures. We use the word new majority. Uh, and that's extremely important to us uh, because I think minority just has so many negative and historical connotations and it's time for us to own our power. So I highlight that exclamation, hearted, everything, fire, you name it. And I would say ignore at your own risk. Um, it's when we look across the globe, African-American culture is the driver of products, is the driver of fashion, is the driver of music. And if, if as we become the majority and we're, we'll become the majority globally, when we look at, you know, lots of times people think about countries like Nigeria, and they'll think Nigeria is like, oh, well, maybe they're 40 million, 50, you know, they're a little bit bigger than, than Canada. No, Nigeria is going to be the third most populous nation by 2050. And they have, will have the youngest uh, population as well. That combined with what else is going on around the globe and we're, uh, where we already are the trendsetters, if you ignore us, it will be at peril. And that's our basic thesis. My literally, my basic investment thesis is, is I believe that there's a normal distribution of talent, but there's not a normal distribution of capital. 
so that if I then focus on just black and brown and make my investments and find the best and brightest there, I am going to, by definition, get the best returns. So Jim, let's 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 pick on that for a moment and 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 focus on um, investors. We hear so much about how difficult it is to place dollars in communities and with investors of color. And yet, you were recently recognized by Eris for your experience and passion for guiding capital to underserved communities. What things do you recommend that government funders and majority investors do to consistently build success in this area? Well, as I just um, had, had stated, Anita, it's my investment thesis um, to be able to, um, the way we look at, and the way that we look at capital is we, we have a little bit of a unique, because the platform I have to be able to direct from is both a for-profit entity and we also have a foundation. So I can look at my capital stack a little bit differently. I can look at my capital stack from philanthropic all the way up. And so I hate the term concessionary returns because I think you can pick where you deploy your capital and get the returns that you expect from where you deploy that capital. And then right. lots of times what you're looking for isn't necessarily a financial return, but an outcome an outcome that creates jobs, that creates housing, that, that creates opportunities. And so we have to push back all the time against investors that come in with this preconceived notion of what an entrepreneur should look like, what a opportunity should look like. When they have been funneled into almost a false narrative of what a investment is supposed to look like or what an investment, more appropriately, what an investment can look like. And so being able to eliminate some of those barriers by having the decision rights over how our capital is deployed is how I try to do that. And by, tr by doing that, and creating models that can then be replicated by other investors, I think is a way to be able to move it forward and to be able to show that this can happen. And the other point I, I, I wanna kind of pull in to, and I, I, I wanna make sure that everybody's aware of, I think it's important that we allow for failure because our counterparts, when they are able to fail, they're also able to learn and to grow. We tend not to have that luxury, but that's part of the process of being able to become a more dynamic leader, a more dynamic investor, a more dynamic entrepreneur, by having tried something and potentially failed at it and learning from that and then being able to take that and to be able to redeploy. So, so I'm, Jim, I'm really glad you raised that point. And I want you to stay on that point for a moment. Okay. It wasn't um, coincidental that I asked about government funders and majority investors. What might surprise people participating in this conference, at least from my perspective, working with local governments, primarily, but not exclusively in North Carolina, and working with funders all over the country, the risk tolerance is actually lower in those two sectors where you might expect them to be higher. So they don't go into a project thinking they have to have the highest return on the investment, that's less the barrier than the concern that it might fail. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's, it's maddening um, sometime. When you think about venture capital, 
you know, what's their hit rate? What's their batting average? A great venture capitalist might have a what? 200, 250 batting average? One out of four is, is, is successful? Private equity, um, again, 300, three out of 10 investments are okay. But when you look at our black and brown counterparts, we're expected to have a 100% success rate. And if we don't, we're done. One of the first uh, funds I invested in when I was at MacArthur Foundation was Penman Partners. Uh, Larry Manson and Kelvin Pennington, they raised $80 million in, um, in the early 90s. They had a successful platform, but because of the pressures and the inability to be able to have their first round of uh, investors show up and show back up for fund two, they never had fund two. You know, many got through, but if they were, if, if, if they had been white, they could have split off, used that track record, and each gone out and, and raised a fund. Now, both Larry and Kelvin have gone on and have been reasonably successful, but it wasn't the same as, you know, when, when you saw like GTCR, all of those initials rolled out into their own opportunities. And a lot of them, they had success. It was pretty good. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't mind blowing, but they had the ability to take what they had done from their um, failure and leverage it exponentially to be able to go forward. So part of what we, we try to do, and I, I, I try to do when I educate our principals on this, is that everything we do isn't going to work. But if we don't do anything, nothing's going to work. Isn't so, that so we lean in, you know, and, and you know, with, with, with Wilson, Lester, and with, with Talib, and, and with Napoleon, you know, we leaned in. They came to me with they came to me with an idea, an idea to be able to be a friends and family round using the 504 SBA loan pool to invest in businesses in black and brown businesses in North Carolina to be able to expand. Now, is the work easy? No, it's not because we're trying to use a vehicle that hasn't been used that way before. So we're we're, we're we push into new territory. But we're doing it and we because we're taking the pain and itching of getting through this we're probably going to be able to create a model that's going to be able to be replicated across the country using a vehicle that is very well known to the government and to banks so that if we get this right we can get underwriting and and make a difference for a lot of small businesses as they expand and small businesses are the core but the other thing that we're also trying to do within that too is we're looking at larger, more sophisticated businesses. So we're gonna be looking at a investment management firm that's gonna be in Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina, that's starting up. It's an entrepreneur who's rolling out, who has a 25 year track record, um, happens to be there, is going to locate in an opportunity zone. We're going to, we, we made a similar investment. So we're literally going to be investing from a, um, from a barbershop to a investment management firm. That's a pretty good economy, but that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to complete. Well, Jim, you're giving me goosebumps. I'm so excited. Um, and I'm going to go to audience Q&A after I give Bill and Melissa a chance to respond to what you said. I think, you know, throughout this conversation, it's been very clear that we're really focused on building up an ecosystem and different organizations play distinct but complementary roles, the three of you and what you do for Black businesses, for underestimated entrepreneurs, certainly make that clear. 
I'm just interested in hearing from Bill and Melissa, um, sort of how they hear your strategies complementing the important work that they do. Well, I mean, I think everything that Jim does is a compliment for, for what I do in terms of helping black entrepreneurs. Um, I, you know, I have to say that Jim is probably one of the most risk tolerant leaning in brothers that I know and who is consistently willing to use his voice uh, and his platform. And I think we need more of that. You know, I think everything he said about failure is extremely important. When we circled back to the seven and a half percent of the entrepreneurs uh, that closed, um, I think it's important to note that they closed for three reasons. They closed because they got COVID, because a family member got COVID and they were forced to take care of them, or they were unable to access PPP, EIDL, or any other kinds of funds. But what's interesting is, though, is that that is not uncommon, right? COVID was really just the spotlight on what happens. We have businesses, particularly in the food and beverage space, that we say have a rolling close. They'll call and say, hey, Melissa, I'm open for these two weeks, but next week I got to go drive Uber or I got to drive Lyft because I need cash to go get my next set of inventory. And so I do think that we have to recognize that this opportunity for failure and, and really expanding our definition of risk, it cannot be based on what we look like. It should be based on the resilience that an entrepreneur has in the face of adversity that they're experiencing, either because of their race, because of their gender, or because of the sector or community where they reside. And I think that that's huge. And so every time Jim has a chance to speak, I just go, I know that I and myself and all of our entrepreneurs we well represented because he has a privilege to sit in places that oftentimes we don't get uh, to sit. And so um, everything that Jim says, I underscore fire, heart, thumbs up. Uh, but I do think this point around failure is extremely important. And I know I, I've seen in the chat, I do think this opportunity around collecting our own capital together to support our communities has to be an ongoing strategy. We cannot just count on the gyms and the bills of the world because there's a greater need. They're doing amazing work, but the need still remains outsized. And I do think that we as a community have to figure out how do we find wealth and cash in our own communities and not have to just wait for white investors and white LPs to validate us so that we can move forward. And it may mean that, you know, much like what Napoleon and the brothers are doing, it's a it's a small friends and family that just grows so we actually get a fair and equitable start. As a professor at Georgetown, I found that it costs $250,000 more for a black entrepreneur to start the same exact business as their white peer. And that's a combination of direct costs because it's legal to charge us higher interest rates. It's also a combination of indirect costs because we don't get into all these accelerator programs that have all these free credits. And so we spend, and we spend four to seven X more on consultants and coaches and mentors because they don't even understand our communities or our businesses. And so at some point in time, I just want to echo the other piece that Jim said and was acknowledged in the chat is that we've got to figure out to do some of this for ourselves uh, because we know what the gaps are. And I think we have the opportunity to do fill some of those gaps that are very early on where we need several thousand dollars before we get to needing hundreds of thousands. And thank God that's where we have Bill and we have Jim and others in that million dollars, but we've got to start that runway so that we can keep going. So I'm going to go to you to ask that question about complementarity, um, Bill. But first I have to acknowledge Melissa is a multi- task or extraordinaire. She's following up with the chat. She's answering the questions. Um, and Tammy, because I don't necessarily share that skill, I've been looking at the questions that came in on the Q&A tab. If you wouldn't mind just scrolling through the comments to make sure that we answer those questions um, in the chat, that would be really great. Thanks, Melissa, for queuing that up. All right, Bill, where do you see the compliment? No, I, I, I will edit my earlier comment. Yes, I do agree with Melissa 11 out of 10 times. <laughs> you know, but, but I think it's, it's, it's significant that it was Jim who made the decision to invest in, in Napoleon and in so many other ventures that he has supported and not other folks who had that same opportunity. And so who makes the decisions matter? Uh, we need more gems. We need more Melissa's. We need more Napoleons. You know, pre pre predominantly white companies need people who bring the perspective of these growing markets into their boardrooms, into their C-suites, uh, into decision-making positions. You know, and the point about failure, yes, um, everyone, you know, it's important to learn from failure. Everybody does it, but there's dramatic differences in one's ability to weather failures. You know, the wealth gaps, 
really, you know, give you a safety net or you free fall into oblivion, you know, 12 to one household wealth gap, white, black, white, 100 to one families, black families with children compared to white families with children. Our most precious resources are on the precipice of poverty. Um, and, and so if you fail and you're a black entrepreneur, then you're on the edge of the abyss, you know? And, and it's, it's, it's interesting that often, you know, social ventures, um, black banks, black community development financial institutions are woefully undercapitalized relative to our peers. So we, my, my policy shop did analysis and showed that black CDFIs are two, white CDFIs have two and a half times more capital. They get larger awards historically from federal programs. And so policymakers need to invest in ways that mitigate these gaps. And not just, you know, business entrepreneurship is important. I think um, it was AEO that did analysis shed, showed that the wealth gap poses to three to one for a black entrepreneurs relative to white entrepreneurs. It's not equal the way it should be, but it's a game changer. Just as home ownership closes the wealth gap, those two things business ownership and home ownership are game changers. Do more than anything else, perhaps other than inherited wealth, which we just ain't got as much as other folks have. You're on mute. Tammy, I see you're on. You want to just let us know what questions you've seen in the chat? Sure, this is great conversation. I really enjoyed. So one of our questions uh, includes what are some strategies to locate and engage with investors? Well, um, partners in equity. You, you, uh, they're, they're here in North Carolina. Um, the work that, uh, that they've done when we, when we first hatched it and we had this idea of being able to deploy capital the thing they did is they went out and they talked to the community. They talked to you know potential targets. They learned what these entrepreneurs needed and what they didn't need. So that we weren't just showing up just with money to say, hey, we're gonna invest in you and we're gonna give it to you in this, these terms. We actually, they actually went out and were able to market and be able to educate and to be able to get feedback from the community. So that that's what's most important for investors like me is that I have to have great partners. You know, I have to have partners that are able to be able to do the work that I can't do. I can't show up everywhere. But if I have a trusted partner in an area, they can. They can get to know the area. They can get to know the ecosystem that, that exists there. And so that's why we're, we're, we're patiently building it so that we can expand it. And we can expand it within North Carolina and expand it nationally. Great, good, good answer. I think Anita, you're still on, you're on mute. The ongoing chat. I'll give you a chance to let us know that later. Go ahead, Tammy. Okay, we have one more question in our Q&A box. It says, how can the flow of capital be funneled into the micro businesses in an equitable way when the criteria to gain the capital is not adjusted? I think that's a great question. And I think we saw, uh, again, with COVID, um, the power of many of the grant programs that, that came forward, right? I think that we saw what entrepreneurs, particularly black entrepreneurs can do with $2,500 or $5,000. Uh, the average PPP loan application for black entrepreneurs was $5,000. So I think that there are now, I'd say new conversations that at least I have am a part of that's talking about what is the capital stack that can be carved out to support micro entrepreneurs while still managing for risk adjusted returns. Um, you know, I do think that they, at least from what I see, there are some corporate partners who will continue to look at that and think about grants. Um, you know, I think the other piece is to really determine in a micro business, what is the growth that you decide? Are you micro at the present time and therefore you need capital or are you really intending just to stay micro, which is fine too. Uh, because I do think there are a lot of uh, emerging funds that are willing to come in early with smaller checks of 25 to 50,000 uh, with the expectation they'll be 
see some kind of out maybe in three to five years. So I would say that the dynamics are changing in the capital stack. You know, we saw that there has been a tremendous commitment uh, over the since, since George Floyd around helping uh, black uh, GPs, um, you know, $66 billion was pledged uh, by corporations post George Floyd to really help. And, and the beauty of that is that $3.2 billion were raised by VC firms, at least one black investment professional. That's an over 100% increase. And many of those have recognized the needs of our community and have a spectrum. So if anyone is looking to connect with a specific investor, uh, then please feel free to email me. Um, I have the privilege to serve as an advisory board member to Black VC. Uh, and then obviously, if there's anybody I connect folks with, happy to do that as well. But I think, to Jim's point, you have amazing resources already there uh, with partners in equity who are killing it in North Carolina. Terrific. And I see that um, in the chat box, there was some question about the geographic footprint for partners in equity. No surprises there that people beyond North Carolina are going to want to have connection to this pretty amazing asset that really, as Jim has said, you know, allows for a distributive network with, with investors. Um, I'm excited to see that um, there's gonna be expansion, but there's also that part of me that's happy that for right now we're focused on, on, on this state, just, just saying true confessions, true confessions. Um, Melissa, is there anything else you saw in the chat box that we failed to cover? When people come to an event like this virtually, it feels particularly important that we try to get their needs met. I don't see anything, but I wanted to just check in since you've been watching the scroll. No, you've, you've done it. I think we've gotten a lot of amen for everything that uh, Jim and Bill and all of us have said, and I think a lot of support amongst the group, so you're good. Terrific. So then the other thing that's equally important to me is to always try to end the session looking forward, that the future focus is what allows all of us to get out of the bed every day. So as you look to the horizon, what's exciting for you? What do you think is the thing, um, whether it is as Bill has said, advocacy or policy, as others have said, it's a data point. I don't really care what it is, but what, what gets you excited and wanting to continue to do this work for the next decade? We'll start with you, Melissa. Uh, I think a couple of things. Um, I think one, I'll say three things. I think what gets excited me every day is that whether it manifests or not, uh, COVID and the death of George Floyd put a spotlight on what Black people have already known, the historical inequities and oppression that we face. And I think even if for a moment caused the current uh, or, or old majority to really understand what was happening in our communities. I think the second thing is, is that I have been on so many more Zoom calls with Black folks that I didn't know. And I think that that's just an amazing sign that our folks are coming together. Uh, it's almost like a rebirth of the Underground Railroad uh, and finding ways to connect with people who are in corporate America and people who are not entrepreneurs, but just really forget what we can do for each other. And the third thing I'll say is that it is not lost on me the amount of money that has been dumped into our communities. And I trust that after 400 plus years of oppression that we are still here, that we are gonna do some pretty effing amazing things with the dollars that we have been given. And while they're not enough, we've already begun to see amazing outcomes in local communities with the dollars they've gotten. And I think we're gonna shock people. Uh, again, will it change? It doesn't matter, but I think it just continues to make the case of that we are resilient people. We deserve to be invested in. If we have to do it ourselves, we're gonna do it ourselves. So I think we've got two minutes left and I will give those equally to Bill and Jim to close us out. Give us one thing that you're really excited about. Um, Go ahead, Jim. I'm, I'm just excited. I'm, I'm excited about the, that I'm able to do the work, that I'm able to be on panels like this with, with Bill and Melissa and, and you, Anita, to be able to talk about this. And as Melissa indicated, I'm, I lean in and I speak the truth to billionaires, to corporate leaders, I've been able to be in position to advise um, C-suite uh, executives at the highest level. And I tell them the truth. You know, I, I don't pull. I don't pull the punch. If they want to keep on doing what they've been doing, then they better get ready to live in the purge, because you can't keep on creating this gap and think that there aren't going to be consequences to it. 
But to that end, I am hopeful that I have seen things that I haven't seen before. And that as minority as or new majority entrepreneurs, and I, Melissa, I'm using that, um, you have to look, your, your, your current can be your community, but your broad has to be the entirety of the marketplace. And you can build your business to be able to compete in that manner. And the good so news- You probably have 15 seconds before they cut us off. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. No, I, 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 amen. Um, I think that a lot of people are saying they're woke. Let's, let's put it to the test. You know, Business Roundtable says the business of corporate is an economy that works for everybody. Let, let's be bold and hold their feet to the fire. I'm optimistic because I know people like the three of you and the Partners in Equity. Thank you all so much for this incredibly rich session. Thank you all for participating. <laughs>